Today, January 22nd, 2008, the New Hampshire House will be addressing HB 1623 FN, an act relative to penalties for possession of marijuana. The official analysis states this bill makes a penalty for marijuana possession in a quantity of less than one and a quarter ounces a violation. NHCommonSense.org is holding a press conference. Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Matt Simon, Executive Director of the New Hampshire Coalition for Common Sense Marijuana Policy. Uh, we're gathered here today in support of House Bill 1623, a bill that would reduce penalties for possession of marijuana in small amounts. Specifically, this bill would reduce the penalty for possessing less than 1.25 ounces of marijuana from a Class A misdemeanor to a violation offense punishable only by a fine of up to $200. Possession of marijuana in private for personal use would still be illegal in New Hampshire, but it would no longer be regarded by the law as a criminal behavior. Our primary argument comes straight out of the New Hampshire Constitution, Part 1, Article 18, tells us that all sentences ought to be proportioned to the nature of the offense. A cursory look at the history of this issue reveals that the effort to deter U.S. citizens from using marijuana lost all sense of proportionality. When President Richard Nixon took office in 1969, the Controlled Substances Act was passed in 1970, and marijuana was placed in Schedule I, the highest of five schedules the Act created. Schedule I is reserved for substances which are deemed to have high abuse potential and no medicinal properties whatsoever. By contrast, opium and cocaine are listed in Schedule II. Yes, cocaine, but not marijuana, is recognized by the U.S. government as having legitimate medical uses, limited though they may be. Continuing with my brief history lesson, the decision to place marijuana in Schedule I was said to be provisional pending the results of Nixon's National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse, which published its results in 1972 and recommended decriminalization of marijuana. Their argument was based on proportionality. As the report stated, the actual and potential harm of the use of the drug is not great enough to justify intrusion by the criminal law and private behavior, a step which our society takes with only the greatest reluctance. There was a backlash against this federal policy at the state level. Oregon became the first state to decriminalize in 1973. Our neighbor Maine was one of the states which followed. President Carter tried to decriminalize marijuana in 1977 using an argument based on proportionality. Penalties against possession of the drug should not be more damaging to an individual than the use of the drug itself and where they are they should be changed, he explained. Nowhere is this more clear than the laws against possession of marijuana in private for personal use. We can and should continue to discourage the use of marijuana, but this can be done without defining the smoker as a criminal. And conservatives, such as William F. Buckley Jr., and Milton Friedman agreed. In fact, they both saw marijuana prohibition, rightly, as a very expensive failure with severe unintended consequences. Here's how Buckley put it. Even if one takes every reefer madness allegation of the prohibition as sat face value, marijuana prohibition has done far more harm to far more people than marijuana ever could. Unfortunately, 30 years after Carter's effort failed, the federal government still hasn't budged and prisons everywhere are bulging. There's some good news in the fact that 12 states have seen fit to decriminalize marijuana. And the results of this fall reform have been favorable in those states. None of the doom and gloom scenarios this bill's opponents may try to scare people with have ever come to pass following decriminalization. It's time to reduce marijuana penalties in New Hampshire. And with that said, I'd like to introduce the prime sponsor of HB 1623, Representative Jeffrey Fronis. Thanks, Matt. <coughs> I'd like to thank everyone uh, for their interest and for coming out today uh, and their interest in this very important issue. Um, I decided to introduce HB 23 out of a fear of what our current drug policy is doing to the futures of our young people. Arrest records for possession alone reach new highs annually, but there is an odious side of this statistic that is often invisible to the public. Those arrested, especially young people, can and frequently lose their chance to succeed in life as a result of the arrest. They become ineligible for financial aid for college, cannot enlist in the armed services, and can even lose eligibility for certain types of employment. If we are concerned enough to not want our young people to go down the wrong track, 
We should do all that we can not to take away the opportunity to get back on the right track. If we want our young people to succeed, we shouldn't be taking the opportunities to, su to succeed away. This bill is about protecting the opportunity for young people to grow up and be productive, fulfilling citizens in their communities. I believe there is a different way, a better way to craft our drug policy, and HB, 12, or HB 1623 provides a sensible alternative to the status quo. Many working in the criminal justice arena, criminal justice arena themselves have said that we are never going to arrest our way out of the drug problem. It is time we start looking for new alternatives. Next, we have Bill Coast. Uh, I'm sorry, co-sponsor Representative Andrew Edwards. Um, sorry. Oh, you have nothing to say. <laughs> He'll say it in the committee. All right. Next speaker is uh, some of you might remember him from last year's effort. He's an active duty New Hampshire law enforcement officer, Bradley Jardis. Thank you, Matt. Uh, my name is Bradley Jardis, and I've been a police officer here in New Hampshire for uh, approximately nine years. Um, I represent an organization called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. We're an organization made up of over 5,000 um, active and retired judges, federal agents, police officers, jail wardens um, from all walks of life who adamantly oppose the war on drugs as we believe it is an abject failure. Um, this bill, um, I believe, uh, is a very good idea because I can tell you from my experience serving in law enforcement that there is such a huge disparity between alcohol and marijuana. In my time in law enforcement, I've been punched, kicked, choked, thrown on the ground, jumped on when I was on the ground by people who drink alcohol. I've gone to numerous fight calls, numerous domestic calls by people who drink alcohol. This has never happened uh, in my experience with someone who just smokes marijuana. Um, criminalizing ch uh, our kids, turning 16-year-olds into criminals, for, uh, for using a drug that, in my opinion, is far less dangerous than alcohol, does nothing but ruin their lives. At LEAP, we like to say you can get over an addiction, but you can't get over a conviction. Thank you. Next, we have a MD, PhD candidate at Dartmouth College. She is Stephanie Murphy. Hello. Um, I live in New Hampshire, and I also attend medical school here. I would like to make it clear uh, to our legislators that in the scheme of things, marijuana is a relatively benign drug. It has a very low potential for addiction. It has, it's virtually impossible to overdose and injure oneself on marijuana. And it's not associated with violence as alcohol is, as Officer Jarvis just said. And, I'm sorry, here's a question my thoughts for a second. Um, in other states in, the, in this country and in other countries around the world where marijuana has been decriminalized, uh, the rates of use among teenagers and among adults have stayed the same or they have decreased. I think that this bill um, will be good for New Hampshire and in terms of its medical impact, nothing's going to change very much. Down to our last speaker, some of you may have heard of an organization called Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Our next speaker founded the Students for Sensible Drug Policy chapter at Franklin Pierce University, and now he's on the National Board of Directors for that organization. Jonathan Perry. Thank you. My name is Jonathan Perry, and I am board member of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, an organization that is run by students and seeks to reduce the harms that are both associated with drug abuse and drug policies. Uh, HB 1623 is one of the ways I think that we can do that. Um, as was mentioned before, young people lose their federal financial aid for no other crime other than a drug conviction. Uh, something as simple as a first time marijuana offense will make you lose your uh, federal financial aid, which will set you on the wrong path for getting over uh, drug abuse or substance abuse or experimentation. Uh, we should be focusing on reducing the penalties so that young people can focus on staying in school and uh, getting on the right path. Thank you. Okay, that's all we have for speakers. Last year we supported a bill that was, that was far more radical and we discussed what sort of thing that they would support and this is within the parameters of that. So we're very optimistic that, that this year we have a bill that, that people can really get behind and can pass.